What's up, everyone? Lukonde Mwila over here. I'm a technical evangelist at SUSE. In this video, I'm going to be talking to you about local cluster development in K8s using Rancher Kubernetes Engine, or RKE as it's popularly known. I thought it would also be beneficial to talk about the pros and cons of local cluster devving versus remote cluster development. You might be thinking of some popular tools like EKS, GKE, and AKS, and they certainly have their place. So I'll also mention some of the use cases when it's best to go with the local cluster option as opposed to remote. If you're only interested in me demonstrating how to provision a cluster with RKE, you can jump ahead to that point in the video. And just so you know that the source code that I'll be walking through is all available in the GitHub repository, and the link to that is below in the description. For most people, their Kubernetes journey is going to start on their local machine with tools like RKE, K3S, KubeADM, Minikube, you name it. And you are constrained um, in the sense that you won't get the same kind of operational agility that you'd get in the cloud, but it's a great opportunity to develop some in-depth practitioner skills. So what are some good use cases for local cluster dev? Uh, POCs, for starters, are great. Essentially, if you want to experiment and you want a low-risk environment, then there's no better place than your local machine because you could essentially make as many uh, make a mess of as many things as possible, and you won't have too much to worry about. Another good use case is small teams. Um, if you're working in a large team, there's a high chance that you'll run into some kind of configuration drift issues. But if you're in a smaller team, it's easier to standardize practices and to align in terms of configurations, etc. cetera. Um, in addition to that would be team objectives. So you do have to ask yourself the question, what is your priority as a team? Is it application development? If that's the case, then you want to alleviate as much of the um, cluster configuration as possible. And so in that case, it is better to streamline things by going with a remote cluster instead, because they take care of a lot of that. But if you know that you're going to be owning a lot of the components inside of the cluster and you're going to be configuring things, then you should get used to that in a local context. Lastly, and this one might be a bit of a no-brainer, is low computation requirements. If you know that you're not going to need any compute intensity um, and your what you have on your machine in terms of its resources will be sufficient for the kind of work you'll be doing, then definitely go local cluster devving. Let's talk pros and cons. We'll start with the pros. In a cloud environment, you have to consider the fact that there are operational costs that you have to deal with. And from a business perspective, you need to be tracking that and monitoring to make sure you're making efficient usage of resources. But sometimes that red tape gets in the way of trying to be efficient and move quickly to just focus on cluster optimization, in which case local devving would definitely be an advantage um, over a remote cluster in this particular case. Next up is environment isolation. Uh, when developers are working in teams, they should be aware of the blast radius in the case that something goes wrong due to some kind of configuration error. Now, when you're working with a local cluster on your machine, then any one of these issues or faults that you run into are respective to your machine, which reduces the risk drastically in the case that it was a shared cluster with, uh, with other developers. So this is a huge benefit because in the case that there's some kind of configuration error or some issue that you run into, those faults and failures are isolated to a single person's machine. Another benefit with a local cluster is having full access. Now, um, cluster configuration can be complex and you want to make sure that you're actually following best practices such as controlling who has access to what and what they're able to do with the different resources and deployment of objects onto your cluster. But uh, when you're developing, you want to have your engineers having as much freedom as possible to make quick progress. And so with a local cluster, you got a lot more freedom. You have full access to um, the cluster itself. As for the cons, you may have already guessed this hardware constraints. Your cluster will be limited to the hardware that you're working with. Uh, generally, Kubernetes is compute intensive, and so you're going to have to modify your cluster to fit within um, the resources that you have available to you. The alternative would be to invest in more expensive hardware to uh, match up to the kind of cluster that you want to be able to run locally, and it can get pretty expensive. Another disadvantage is the fact that Kubernetes does have a steep learning curve. And so when it comes to local cluster development, you do need to be familiar with the Kubernetes architecture, its various components, and how they interact. 
I know that there are great tools out there that really simplify setting up a cluster and some default configuration for you, but you still need to know what's going on because you're going to be changing it and modifying it to match what your particular requirements are. Third is potential environment disparity, and this is a really important one. It's all good if you can configure your cluster to an optimal state um, locally, but if your destination is the cloud environment, you need to be aware of the fact that in the cloud, you're going to have, you're going to be dealing with complex network architectures, different features and integrations that you want to consider for your cluster. And this will have implications on the declarations that you made for your cluster state. And so you're going to have to deal with bridging that gap between local and remote. And this can be laborious and time consuming and you should be aware of it. All right, the next step is to turn our attention to provisioning the cluster with RKE on our machine. And to do that, I am making use of Vagrant and VirtualBox to provision some VMs to run locally. And um, so what we're looking at over here is my Vagrant file. And as you can see, I have a cluster that will consist of one master and two worker nodes. Each one has been assigned a static IP address and is part of a private network. Um, you can configure it to be part of a public network. Um, in addition to that, I am making sure that each node is provisioned with a particular script. And the reason for that is the nodes need to be prepared uh, for RKE. And the most important requirement would be to make sure that you can actually um, have SSH um, connection from your RKE workstation, because um, that's how RKE's host communicates with the uh, downstream nodes. And um, in addition to that, another important prerequisite is to have Docker. So you can see over here at the top is me um, actually just starting off with that configuration to make sure that um, SSH password authentication is enabled and I'm setting the root password. You will be prompted for the root password when you are trying to establish a connection to these nodes. And we'll have a look at that a little bit later. Um, then once I'm done with that, I just need to make sure that each one of my nodes actually has Docker installed, which is the commands that I'm running through over here. And um, once I'm done with that, I create the required directories as well as creating the JSON config file for the daemon and then start it up as you would expect to make sure that that is running um, accordingly. In addition to that, a couple of other things. Um, if you're familiar with uh, provisioning a KH cluster, some of this might look familiar to you. And um, what I'm doing over here is memory swapping um, is being disabled to avoid any perform performance and stability issues and so that the kubelet on the nodes can start up correctly. Um, in addition to this, I'm uh, disabling the firewall. Um, you don't have to do that. You could actually just configure it um, for the relevant network traffic that you want for the ports. Um, and then next, um, K8 requires packet traversing um, a network bridge to be processed by IP tables for filtering and for port forwarding. So you need to ensure that the following are set um, to one in the system control configuration file. And then lastly, I just run this command here to ensure that the bridge network filter module is actually loaded. Great. And so um, to create the virtual machines. I'm going to head over here to my terminal. Now, I've already run this, but you can go ahead and run the vagrant up command, and this will create your virtual machines. Bear in mind that I'm in the root directory um, for this um, project. So assuming that you have cloned the repository, this would be the location that you would run it from. Now, just to confirm that it is actually that my VMs are running as expected, I'm going to hit the vagrant status command. And there we go. We can see that each one of my nodes has been um, created. Now, once that is done, the next step is to actually um, run the relevant RKE commands to create the cluster. And um, there are two ways of doing this. The first step would be to run the RKE config command. Oops. And um, this will prompt you with a series of questions um, just so the RKE has um, an understanding of the kind of cluster configuration that you actually want before it provisions it. Once you've run through each one of those questions, it will create a cluster.yaml file for you. Um, and so I have a preferred approach, and that is to actually just go ahead and create my cluster.yaml file um, beforehand, which is this file over here. 
And as you can see, um, I have created, um, or rather I have uh, declared my nodes and I make sure that each one of the addresses for these um, respective nodes matches the IPs that I um, set up inside of my Vagrant file for the virtual machines. So just make sure that that declaration matches. Also, you would, you can assign each one of your nodes um, a particular role. And you'll see over here that this um, node with this IP for uh, my master node is going to take up the role of the control plane and will also have the etcd database uh, stored inside of it. Um, and that just matches um, the master node over here because that's the role that it's going to function in. In addition to that, you'll remember that we were setting up um, SSH password authentication uh, for the root user. And so make sure that you have the correct user set up over there for each one of the nodes. Um, and then I replicate most of the configuration for the others. The only ch difference would be that the other two nodes are fulfilling the role of uh, worker. Okay. Um, many of the other properties that I'm defining or declaring over here are actually not required, but um, are good to, to have um, for the type of cluster that you want to have. You can actually, this file can get very big. I'd encourage you to have a look at the um, Rancher documentation to see um, a very verbose or comprehensive cluster.yaml file, depending on what you're trying to set up. And um, you can see over here, I'm just setting up the name for my cluster. In addition to that, um, very important would be the CIDR um, ranges or the IP ranges for your services. You need to make sure that your service cluster IP range um, matches um, the same one for the uh, cube, um, for rather the, the cube controller service cluster IP range, as you can see over here, these two match. Um, and then you also define the cluster CIDR, which this would be for the pods that are in your cluster. Um, so a lot of this will be done for you by default. Um, and But um, I want to define these things myself and just make sure that you have the same, we're making use of the same CIDR ranges. So keep that in mind um, for the net, for networking purposes. Um, in addition to that, down here, um, I'm selecting the network plugin that I want. I want to make use of Calico. Um, Rancher's um, <clears throat> tool, RKE, does allow you to make use of the other main network plugins like Weave, um, Flannel. Uh, and so um, you can choose to not define this over here, and it will pick one for you by default. Um, I like Calico, so I'm going with it over here. And then obviously de declaring the DNS provider that I want to make use of. Again, these. Um, these properties aren't necessary, but um, I'm going ahead and enabling RBAC um, as well as um, I want to make use of the metric server. So I, de I declare all of these things. So this file would could be generated for me if I just run through the RK RKE config steps. Um, alternatively, you can go ahead and create it like I have done. Um, and this is in the repository. And um, the next step would actually just, I'm um, going to head back to the terminal would be to run the RKE up command. Um, but um, before I forget a very important step, what you actually need to do to ensure that you have um, communication with your RKE workstation, which is in my case is my local machine or my host, um, whereas the virtual machines are the guests and I want communication there. The next step is to copy over the SSH keys to uh, the relevant hosts or nodes. And so to do that, um, I run this SSH copy ID command, um, and I'd have to do this for each one of the nodes. So the only difference for each one of them would be the last digit for the IP addresses. Now, because I've already done this, I'm just going to receive an error letting me know that this has actually already been carried out. As you can see over there, um, they already exist on the remote system. So, and the next step um, would be to run RKE up in order for RKE to provision this cluster on the nodes. So this might take a couple of minutes. Um, and uh, obviously, because the, uh, the images have to be pulled um, and the containers to get started, because remember, RKE creates your cluster and runs it in Docker containers. So I'm going to wait for this to finish. Great, as you can see, um, the process was successful. And so I'm just going to clear my screen and I'm going to LS so you can see some generated files over here. We've got the cluster state file, which has been created, as well as the cube config file. If I head over to VS Code, if you want to have a look at these. And so um, this file contains, um, as you would expect, all of the necessary uh, cluster configurations and current state um, of my cluster. Bear in mind, this is something that can be backed up. And over here, I have my cube config file that has been generated for me. So the next thing that you want to do is to copy over um, the config file. And then you can check to make sure 
that you are connected to the relevant cluster. And I am, as I, as you can see over here, I'm just going to clear the screen. And I make use of this of a tool um, called K9S. It's a great way to have a visual um, display of everything going on inside of your cluster. So I'm just going to run K9S over here. And there we go. So you can see the um, pods that are currently running. I've got um, Ingress, uh, Nginx, uh, I've got Calico, uh, Cordian S, uh, and Metric Server. And um, that is pretty much it. Um, I've been able to provision my cluster and you can go ahead and start devving. Well, I hope that was helpful to you. Uh, please do subscribe to the channel if you're interested in more videos like this. And if you'd like to engage with myself and other cloud native practitioners, do have a look at the Seuss and Rancher community website. I've put the link below in the description.